y'all can go home now. <laughs> I was uh, speaking to a group in uh, Lexington, Kentucky several years ago, and uh, I don't take myself very seriously, and, or anything else for that matter, but uh, I made the quip that uh, I'm probably the biggest beekeeper in the state of Kentucky, and at that time I said I, I weigh about 275 pounds. <laughs> I'm not that big of a deal anymore, but uh, I said that, and a man that I actually knew at the time, Tommy Ham, he stood up in the back of the room. I had no idea Tommy was there. He weighed about 400 pounds. He said, <laughs> he said I beg to differ. <laughs> All right, I'll see that point. But uh, uh, I am an Eastern Apiculture Society uh, certified master beekeeper, but I've never yet had a bee that recognized that title. <laughs> Believe me, I mean, I know how to raise bees. I know how to raise queens. I've done it for a lot of years. But uh, sometimes I go places and people think I have some kind of a magic potion because I'm a master beekeeper that my bees don't die or my bees are really nice to work and they won't sting you, or my queens always just lay scads of brood. It's not that way. My bees are no different than your bees. The only way I stay in business is knowing how to take one hive and make five out of it that, and raise my own queens from the stock that survives. And that, that's how I stay in business. Um, if it'll kill a mite, I'll use it if I have to. I despise rural mites. I despise, I used to not hate anything. Then I started keeping bees. And I, I hate mice and I hate skunks and I hate the rural mites. I hate stuff you can't even see. You know? <laughs> I hate these viruses. But uh, you've got to keep your bees healthy. Parasite free and healthy. You've got to make sure you have a laying queen in the hive, a productive laying queen. And you've got to make sure that the bees have food. If you take care of those three things, most everything else will take care of itself. And then it don't. <laughs> <laughs> That's true most of the time, but not all the time. And when that quits being true and your bees don't, you know, that don't take care of itself, then you got to know how to make more bees. And that's, at our bee school, that's pretty much what we teach. We teach how to figure out what's going wrong, how to fix it, and how to make bees to replace your losses. Because uh, one of my favorite sayings that has been uh, stolen from me by some other friends of mine that speak about bees, and I, I told them they were free to steal it because I steal enough stuff from other people that I can't fuss about that. <laughs> One of my favorite sayings is there's only two absolutes in beekeeping. If you keep bees, you will get stung. Sooner or later, you're going to get stung. The longer you go without getting stung, the more spectacular it's going to be. When you're <laughs> You're going to think you're the golden boy that the bees all love, and then all of a sudden you're going to realize they hated you all the time. <laughs> you will get stung and your bees will die. The colony that you thought uh, was going to be there the next year to raise queens out of or to make a big crop of honey, you're going to go out there and it's going to be empty. Or they're all going to be dead laying on the bottom board. It happens. That that's the nature of beekeeping anymore. It didn't used to be that way, but it is now. And we got to live in the here and now, not in the golden days. Uh, if you just mind those first three principles that I gave you, healthy bees, parasite free, as parasite free as possible, productive queen, and food. If you, if you pay attention to that, then you're ahead but you're not home free. So, at this time of year, if your bees are alive, that's great. But uh, don't count on them staying alive until the honey flow gets here. 
typically March is about the most hazardous month that we have because temperatures are so up and down. Now, you guys that have had bees for any length of time, I'm sure that you've gone out in the spring and you found a, a nice cluster of bees as dead as a hammer with honey that far away from them. And they have their heads stuck in the cells. And uh, when I was just starting beekeeping, I found that. And I asked the fellow that introduced me to beekeeping. He was not a beekeeper, he was a bee haver. He had bees and took advantage of them. And uh, if they lived, they lived. If they didn't, he'd catch a swarm the next year. That was just his management style. And uh, I said, Hoyt, what happened to these bees? He said, well, they starved to death. Look, they got all looking in the cell trying to find food. No, they're not. They did starve to death. But it's not because there wasn't food in the hive. The bees that have their heads in the cells, and this is why a winter cluster, to be effective, has to have open comb. They have to put their heads in the cells, facing one another in a cell, and work their flight muscles to create heat. And the bees that are in between the frames layer themselves, just like shingles, and insulate. And that frame itself becomes like a heat sink. And that's what keeps the cluster warm. Well, these bees are going to run out of fuel. The heater bees are going to run out of fuel. They come out. It never gets so cold that bees can't move inside the cluster. But it gets cold enough that when it gets below about 35, maybe 30 degrees, the cluster becomes static in the hive. It won't move. It can't move. It's too cold. As long as that cluster can move, they can move to food. But when it gets 30 degrees and they're here, if they're not clustered within range of honey, it takes about two days for that colony to die. That's how quick a colony can die from something that we have no control over. <coughs> so when you find your dead cluster and honey that far away from it, well, it makes you think of some pretty bad language, but uh, <laughs> uh, there's nothing you can do about that except know how to replace it. And that's the frustration of beekeeping, is that sometimes the answer to the problem is not very satisfying. Now, for you guys and gals that are fairly new to beekeeping, don't be intimidated by thinking, well, I can't do that. That's, you're talking about raising bees, like raising cattle or something. The bees do it themselves. They're above, and they manage to do this themselves every year. That's what a swarm is. Do it for them. Splitting the hive is very elementary. Um, at our bee school, I started uh, doing this bee school about 22 years ago. And it started for one purpose, was to bring other beekeepers in my area up to speed. I was frustrated that everybody was worrying me to death. <laughs> about every little thing. And nobody knew. I said, well, ask Wes. He know, he's got bees. Well, he don't know. Why not? He's had bees 15 years. Why, why does Hoyt not know this? Why does... So we started this bee, beekeeper school just to educate ourselves. And I've learned a lot at the beekeeper school myself. But uh, now we have a really, really good Group, local group that uh, I bet 90% of our club splits highs and they're not they're no geniuses they're no smarter than I am well probably are but uh, <laughs> they're, they're probably are smarter than I am but they're no geniuses they still live in West Kentucky <laughs> That's evidence enough. That's fine. I live close to a little town called Cuba, Cuba, Kentucky, halfway between Cuba and Palo Alto. And neither one of those places has a post office. And they really don't have anything except a few people that live there. But uh, if you live in Cuba, 
It's because you want to live in Cuba or you can't live anywhere else. One of those, other, one of those things. That's the way our, our area in West Kentucky, that's how it is. So you guys can split these. You can make divisions of your hives. It's not a big deal. Now, probably the most satisfying thing to me at our B-School is when at the end of the B-School, somebody says, I never thought I could do this, but there's nothing to it. Yeah, I mean, I may have lost a customer selling nukes or selling queens, but I'm happy for it. Because uh, all you guys, if you're going to stay in beekeeping, you need to know how to do this. Because he may have a bad year this year, but he may not. Your bees on one side of the mountain may find it hard to survive, and yours on the other end of the valley or something might do pretty good. You may have to depend on him splitting bees and buy bees from him. Well, next year it could be the other way around. And the whole the whole message here is just to learn from one another and lean on one another in this beekeeping thing. Because uh, some guy that was really smart and got quoted a lot said, no man's an island to itself. And that's true in beekeeping. Um, even if I think that I can get by without having any help with beekeeping. Some years it's not that easy. And uh, I work fairly closely with uh, four different commercial beekeepers. Two of them really close with them. And one of those guys lost 16,000 colonies last winter. <laughs> yeah. Talking about feeling sorry for yourself for losing two hives. <laughs> <laughs> even those guys lose bees. And even those guys aren't an island to themselves. They need they need the support of the beekeeping community and they have friends that they work together. And uh, several years ago I did some work for one guy that's kind of in this old boys club of commercial beekeepers and uh, it happened that what I what I did was right and it worked and that, that was my ticket into their little guys club <laughs> they, they have no reason to pay any attention at all to me but one year I made a big difference for them and they've never forgotten it and I won't ever forget the help they've been to me because if I need queen cells, I've got queen cells. If I need if I need two weeks of work, I've got two weeks of work. And they pay good. <laughs> but but uh, that's really the takeaway from learning about how to make bees, learn how to make bees and work as a community, as a beekeeping community not just as one beekeeper with another beekeeper over here and another one over here. Learn from one another. Uh, start your own school. Our, our bee club, this used to be uh, Kent's Bee School. Uh, and now it's the Lake Barkley Beekeepers, Beekeeper School. Because I, I told the club that you guys are getting good enough that you need to come out here and do some work. So now we have a dozen different guys teaching the things that they learned 20 years ago at the bee school we're good teachers too and, and uh, y'all do the same thing so it it has uh, become our bee clubs bee school and it's an outreach to the beekeeping community in general not just in west kentucky because we have people from michigan and pennsylvania and ohio and chicago I mean, pain to have to let those guys in, but <laughs> uh, I usually tell them I don't mind them bringing clothes, but I don't want to see furniture. <laughs> but, uh, but things like that spread out, and it, it does make a difference in the beekeeping community. Now, I never go anywhere and speak that one of the first things I say is that the floor is always open. Because I can stand here and talk about beekeeping or whatever about beekeeping or bees all night long and maybe not get close to what you want to 
here or what you want to talk about. So if you have a question about beekeeping, if I don't know it, somebody else will. And if nobody knows it, we'll uh, laugh about it and say it's one of those impossible questions. <laughs> uh, I, I usually say that uh, something like, if I don't know the answer, I'll lie so convincingly that you won't even realize it. <laughs> I didn't know, didn't know the answer. But uh, really, if you have a question, ask, because that's how you learn stuff, is asking. What are you doing this time of year with your bees? That's my question to you guys. What's your main concern at this time? And I, I'm not much on monologues. I mean, I stand up here and talk, but I'm just rattling because I don't really like to talk in front of people. You know? <laughs> but uh, uh, I like dialogues. I like you guys talking with me and me talking with you. So. What's your main concern with your bees right now, this time of year? Yes. It's uh, awfully warm, awfully early. Uh, flowers are popping up. It's okay if the daffodils in the front yard die, but we're not real keen about our bees doing that. Yeah. Well, they probably will. <laughs> <laughs> that was a quick answer. I wasn't expecting it. <laughs> but uh, warm, a warm, the hazards of a and early spring, early warm spring, the hazards are you're always waiting for that other shoe to drop. Wait for that cold snap that's going to catch your bees in a cluster down here in the corner and they're not going to be able to move up here to where the honey is. The queen has laid, right now, the queen's probably laying. Probably laying pretty good because you've got pollen, fresh pollen coming in. you got a little fresh nectar coming in. That's going to kick things into gear, especially for Italians. Your Russians and Carniolans may not be laying yet because they're kind of hard-headed about that sort of thing. But uh, um, the danger is the queen lays a little patch of brood down here that's this far from honey. Bees are not going to leave that brood. Honey bees will not leave open brood unless, you know, not of their own accord, unless you make them leave it. Honey bees don't care about calf brood, but they care a lot about larva, uncapped brood. If you're wanting to keep a swarm in a hive, if you're wanting to hold bees in a hive, put a frame of larva in there. The bees will stay with that larva. And a person asked me once, uh, why is that? I said, well, look at it this way. If you're laying in bed at 2 o'clock in the morning, somebody rings the doorbell, and you go to the doorbell and there's a baby on the doorstep, you say, oh, there's not a human alive. I wouldn't say, oh, a little baby. I'm going to take it in. I'm going to love it take care of it. But if you open the door and there's a mouthy 13-year-old, <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to be so generous. <laughs> that is the difference between a larva and a pupa. <laughs> a, a pupa has body parts. A pupa has a head, a thorax, it has all the glands that an adult bee does. It has an abdomen. Those glands are beginning to work. The bees recognize that pupa as being a peer. They recognize that larva as being a baby that needs raising. The larva does not have body parts like a pupa does. A big change goes on in metamorphosis. Yes? So what do we do if uh, there's a tornado that hits your bee yard? What does the bees do? Well, they find a new home. <laughs> Usually it's a long way away. <laughs> um, I had a tornado hit a bee yard one time. Uh, I had some bee yards that went through Hurricane Katrina. And unbelievably, not one single top blew off of a hive during Katrina. And they were right, I mean, right in the eye wall. Of it. <coughs> the only hive I lost in Katrina was a limb fell off a tree and crushed a hive. That's the only hive I lost. And, but the funny thing was, for two weeks after Katrina, um, the bees stayed on the outside of the box. I guess they were waiting on the next one to come. They're going to leave quick. You know, <laughs> I guess. But, uh, Maybe they were waiting for the help. And before Katrina, none of my bee yards, I had five bee yards at that time in South Mississippi. Before Katrina, I had never seen an adult hive beetle 
in any of my bee yards in South Mississippi. After Katrina, every hive I had had small hive beetles. It was almost instantaneous. And uh, last year, I had a bee yard in South Mississippi destroyed by a tornado that I mean, it just went right it's straight through it if you draw a line. And uh, I went and picked up the equipment that I could find, pieces and parts of it, and uh, tucked my tail between my legs and left. And when the tornado hits your bee yard, you salvage what you can, hope that the bees are in a better place. You hope they've made preparations for the next life. <laughs> Not a lot you can do when a hive is destroyed. I mean, what happens to the bees? Maybe, maybe the swarm left. You might find bees hanging in the trees after a big storm like that destroys hives. Catch them like a swarm. Sometimes you'll find those that have multiple queens in it because it's actually two hives that went, what was left of them congregated together. Catch them like a swarm and try to salvage what you can. That's the best you can do in a situation like that. Yes, sir? Ken, uh, uh, what are the conditions you look for uh, to know it's time to start uh, splitting your hives? Well, you look. Th there's different reasons to split a hive first. And conditions that you look for to indicate that you need to start splitting depends on why you're going to be splitting it to begin with. Uh, if you're splitting a hive for the purpose of trying to reduce the swarming uh, instinct in the hive, as soon as that brood nest starts getting a little bit congested, by congested, the queen is probably not going to go past the end of honey. Lay eggs. When a brood nest becomes defined by honey, that's the time you need to split it because that brood nest is never going to be able to get any bigger than it is right then if it becomes defined by a band of honey. Now, sometimes bees will chew that honeycomb up and move the honey and let the queen go up. Don't count on that, especially in the spring. Now, there, if you wait for them to do it, they may decide that uh, that was that's a good way to fool the beekeeper and we'll use that trick again sometime. <laughs> but uh, it may swarm. A congested congested brood nest, when, uh, when you see nectar or pollen, but especially nectar in the center of the brood area, they're not going to stop putting nectar in the brood area until that hive's honey bound. <coughs> when that hive gets honey bound, they'll either swarm or supersede the queen. Later in the summer, they'll just supersede the queen. Early in the spring, when the hive gets honey bound, they'll swarm. And those are two indications, you know, the, the congested brood nest defined by honey that's wrapped it, or nectar inside in cells in the brood nest. Those are two indications that you need to be dividing that hive. Uh, if you're splitting the hive just for the purpose of making an increase in your number of bees. As soon as you get four or five frames of brood in the hive, you can split it. Always leave fewer frames in the hive that's going to stay in its original location because it's going to catch all the foragers coming back. If you have five frames of brood, leave two where the hive is setting and put three in your nuke. And everybody ought to have at least a few nukes. Nuke <coughs> Uh, I recommend until you get 25 or 30 hives to have a nuke for every hive that you own. And it's just a really good management program. If you have a nuke, as soon as that hive, as soon as you have four or five frames of bees in a hive, split it into the nuke. And whether you're raising your own queens, putting a mate, buying a mated queen, putting her, it doesn't matter. Uh, change the queen on the stand, you know, the parent hive, change the queen there, put the old queen with the nuke. Keep that nuke going all summer long. <coughs> if you need a queen, you've got one. And as that nuke grows, remove remove frames of brood from it and put in your other production hives. You won't believe how much difference that'll make in your honey production. 
you've got a nuke there. If something happens to a hive, something goes wrong, you can plug that nuke in and fix it. And it's just, it's a good cheap form of insurance for the price of a queen, or if you raise your own, for the price of some sweat, a little bit of labor, you can have an insurance policy against losing a queen or losing a hive, period. You don't have to, it, it relieves a lot of anxiety. And that's really the toughest part of uh, learning how to become a beekeeper. And becoming a beekeeper is pushing through that anxiety of worrying about, are my bees still alive? What's going to happen? It's too warm now. And, and what if it gets cold? And uh, what, what if we have a drought? this year? What if, uh, what if we have a tornado come through the bee yard? Uh, that just relieves a lot of anxiety. If you have a, if you kind of have an escape plan there, you know, a way to get out. But those are the two, two reasons you would split, to keep them from swarming or to make an increase. Making an increase might mean you're going to sell them too. A lot of money in nukes. I mean, if you're raising your own nukes, pretty good form of income, but uh, I'd, recommend, I'd recommend everybody do it. Yes? You uh, brought up small hive meals, and I'm wondering what, what you do to, to treat or to just deal with them during the year. Well, it taught me a whole different set of language. <laughs> but, uh, I, I, don't, uh, I don't do anything for small hive beetles. I have done everything. <laughs> and I realized that they can reproduce faster than I can kill them. And here's the thing with small hive beetles. You've got to have a queen right hive. If you don't have a queen right hive, now, you don't have to have a laying queen in the hive, but you've got to have a queen right hive. As long as that queen pheromone's in there, the bees are going to be somewhat hygienic. They're going to have a hope that sooner or later we're going to have some babies in here to take care of. So they're going to keep the place clean. If you have larvae in a hive, your bees are as hygienic as they will ever be. But as soon as there's no queen, no queen pheromone, and no larva in a hive, every bee in the hive becomes a forger. There's not any house bees, there's not any nurse bees, nobody cares if the floor is swept because we're all going out hunting groceries. And at that point, within anywhere from three to five days, small hive beetles will destroy that hive. Or they can. They're capable of it. So, you got to have a queen right hive, preferably a laying queen. Um, after that, you need to do something to treat the ground to keep beetles from pupating in the ground and coming back up and multiple generations reproducing at the same time in the hive. Small hive beetles are, they belong to a class of beetles that do not just produce one flush of brood and quit. A lot of, a lot of beetles and a lot of insects do that. They produce one flush of, of young and then they either die or they're not reproductive.